The illustrious Jabba bids you welcome. I'm going to regret this. I'm Pete Mitchell. He's Peyton Jones. And this is the Church Planner Podcast. Brought to you by Church Planner Magazine. Hey, Church Planner, this is Pete Mitchell. And this is Peyton Jones. And this is the first time we've done a podcast the day it's being released. Usually we do it a few days before we record. Oh, and yeah. then we release on Monday. That's right. That's right. It's almost But you're alive. late. You're late by a few days. I am. But uh, Pete, yeah. I'm going to be a little bit late. Can you hold on first? Hey, four days, four and a half. <laughs> yeah, totally, man. So what's going on? What's new? Well, oh man, it's, I'm still in the thick of it. As you can see from uh, all the stuff behind me, that's not even half, like you're looking at the good half. Let's put it this way. Everything on the other side of me is like a hurricane here. So yeah, starting to get books on shelves, which is good. And I realized that I built for myself about half of what I need. To house what I have left of my library, which means my library is cut in half again. But this time I decided rather than loading people like Ruben Young up, literally the last time I cleansed my library, he left with some of the best books. I mean, his wheels were almost touching the wheel wells. It was like his entire backseat and trunk were filled with books. You know what he did with that, right? Sold them. eBay. Nice. Nice. Well done. He's a thinker. I'm I'm somewhat ashamed of myself for 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 getting taken like that. Well, it's your spirit. You're a giving kind of guy. I I am. I am. And uh, you know, <clears throat> but um yeah, I was like, dude, these will set you up. And someone did that for me. There was a guy that used to uh he was a Methodist circuit preacher in Wales. And he was like, Hey, come over to my library. You can take fifty volumes of your choice out of my library, which that's legit when a dude does that. And that was the the first time someone did it. The second time was my mentor, Lloyd Jones's protege, uh, Peter Jeffrey, who then did the same. And I got some incredible stuff. So, Didn't we have Peter Jeffrey on the podcast? No, because he, well, did we, inter- we didn't interview him. I don't think that was it just was a material that we had from him. Or yeah, something? we had an interview. I did. I did a three part interview, which is freaking amazing. Um, with him early on. I still lived in Wales. That was one of the last things I did before I left Wales because I knew he was going to die. So I was like, well, I better hurry up. Hey, you got to remind me, man. I got a story to tell you off the, the podcast about uh, about a guy I know who goes or went to um, somebody's church. I don't want to say their name, which is why I want to tell it to you offline. Okay. But it's uh, it's an interesting story. I mean, it's a church planner. Very famous church planner. Oh. That you and I have discussed many a time. Oh, I know, I know, I know who you got. No, you yeah. don't. No, no you I don't. don't. Hey, he, here you go. Maybe now you'll know. He's in Arizona now. I don't know. Was in Washington. <laughs> Washington State? Was in Washington State. Oh. Come on, you know. I don't know. But anyway, no, it's it's a, it's it's an interesting story. It's really interesting. And we can't tell it on the podcast? No, because I don't want to be, you know, telling. Oh, I got you. you I know. got you. Hearsay and stuff. Well, yeah. That little so thing called integrity. I got you. I but got you, uh, this is from a guy who. Was who said Pete Mitchell church. hasn't changed in the last 10 years? Dude, I've changed. <laughs> I don't know for the better. So have I, unfortunately, but for the worst. <laughs> Dude, I'm telling you, like when you said. You know, I felt God was telling me I needed to call through that list. And you were the first person I called and the last person I called. And I said to you, are you sure it was God who wanted you to call through the list? I'm just saying. Maybe there was something else at work. No, definitely not, man. It was a Lord. I knew it unmistakably. God was like, okay, that was the guy you're supposed to call. But uh, so uh, Friday, Friday's the big day for me. Friday's the day I got scheduled for the tattoo. Yeah. 
this, and you're getting that verse that you shared me. I'm getting that verse. That I, I was thinking it. about getting the nun on the other arm, but really, I have. So tell me, I see it. that all the time. Tell me the significance of that. That's the letter nun in Arabic for Nazarene, and that's what ISIS was putting on all the Christian oh. homes. Like the Christians, I was thinking N O N E, like you're, and you're you a nun. You have no religious affiliation right. now. You're one yeah. of the nuns. Thank you. Thank you. I do the Church Planner podcast. I have no religious affiliation. Church zero, nun, not. I mean, these are all, you know, synonyms. I, I figure you just really like my book. No, that that was where they were. ISIS was putting the, the mark on their homes and basically saying, you're going to convert or we're going to kill you. Wow. And, uh, and then even if they did convert, they'd kill them. So, I mean. Oh, really? Yeah, they didn't care. One way ticket to Allah? Yeah, pretty much. So, so that's why you see it everywhere because people are like trying to stand in solidarity with the persecuted church. And it's a conversation starter. Like I was telling Dan about it after our podcast this morning. And he's got that on like one of his training helmets or something like that. And he goes, sometimes it leads to gospel conversations because everyone's like, why is this white guy wearing a Arabic symbol? Well, it's funny you mention this because I thought I was going to be a missionary to the Muslim world at one stage. So I wanted um, Jesus in Arabic tattooed. And I was like, well, if I go to the Middle East and put that on, I'm, I'm a dead man. So I better not do that. So for missionary purposes, I decided not to do it. But um, yeah, that's, uh, that's good. So I, you can kiss your missionary days to the Middle East goodbye, Pete. Not necessarily. See, they got these things called sleeves. And I could just cover oh, it up. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Because trust me, this redhead would be decked out in full long <laughs> clothes, <laughs> hats. I, I would be the guy with, you know, the robe that went all the way past his fingers. And yeah. So I saw, it's funny. I just saw you, you and I were talking about the film Nobody, which I'm hoping to watch in the next couple of days. And um, I want to buy it. I like it. Yeah. I mean, can you rent it now? Online. I don't know. I don't know. So I gotta, I gotta check that out. But, anyways, um, I I saw an article pop up today that was like the toxic masculinity of of nobody and showed all these action films. And I was just thinking, you know, how ironic, like the disconnect that people have between, you know, the fact that we just celebrated Memorial Day, right? Like for people that gave their lives in toxic masculinity, right? Um, what some might call toxic masculinity, others might call well, that's kind of being a soldier, you know? And um, and I, I'm just, I'm tripping out over the way that the narrative in the last, like probably three, four years is changing so drastically that um, this has been a move to, to really get rid of um, – any scent like uh, men are under attack. If, if it's masculine, toxic masculinity to me is predating on women, um, abusing women. Yeah. To me, that's toxic masculinity. But something that, you know, MMA, it's not toxic masculinity. Um, things that dudes like just being a dude, like being a soldier. I come from a military family. It's not toxic masculinity, you know? So, I mean... I, it, it's weird, man. So uh, that made me think of you this morning because I know you love that film. Because I'm, as I'm toxic, toxic, toxic male. Yes, as a toxic male. I am toxic. There's no doubt about it. But that's a good movie. I enjoy yeah, it. Man. Cool, cool. Hmm. Anything new happening? See, it's an afternoon podcast. It's not going to be as lively as our morning ones. Oh, that's true, huh? That's true. Um, what's going on? Well, uh, so I, I've been... My family has been venturing forth into public with me, um, and I'm wearing the ninja pants, which uh, at church I got asked. Cause I wore Do you church. wear it with the G.I. Joe shirt? The G.I. Joe? Oh, no, I haven't. What are you thinking? <gasps> what a combination. What a combo. So, so if you don't know, I have two G.I. Joe shirts, and one is Snake Eyes and one is Storm Shadow. Both ninjas, one more of a commando. In fact, it says commando on the front, like, like which is weird because it should say Snake Eyes. Right. But right. if you remember when that came out, um, I've got, uh, yeah, I've got um, a, uh, sorry, someone's emailing me. They want me to pay money. <laughs> 
emailing, but texting me. And uh, you know how like when you tell people, yeah, I can do such and such between this time and that time, but not after this time. People don't tend to listen to that. Yeah. Or like when you tell someone, hey, we're going to do our podcast at this time and then they show up late. Oh, one minute, one minute late, one I'm, minute. I'm messing with you. <laughs> no, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. You're four uh, days late. Come on. I am four days late. That's true. So uh, what was I talking about? I don't, I don't know. know. Uh, I Ninja got interrupted. Pants, venturing out. Yeah. Hey, guys, commando. Oh, yeah. But on the original um, thing, it did say commando underneath his name. Oh, so I, I, I get it. Yeah, it'd say commando because we didn't know what he was. You know, he's going to be In fact, for that matter, I didn't even know what a commando was when I first got him. I was just like, that guy with the cool black thing. And oh, when he came out with the wolf, what? And like a little gray plastic wolf. I don't remember that. Yeah. Was it like his dog? Yeah. It was like his little wolf. He came at, at one stage. And I can't remember. I think that was like second edition command. I don't think the first edition he had the wolf. But um, but when he came out with the wolf, it was pretty cool. And he had a backpack with samurai swords in it. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. 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 Pretty cool. And an Uzi. Really? Yeah. He came I didn't know he used a gun. I thought he always used his swords. No, he primarily used an Uzi, but he used the sword and the knife when he needed it. That was pretty really? cool. Yeah, because he's a commando, you know. Uzis are horrible guns, by the way. Are they? I'd like two. I just know that you can hold one in each hand, like on the sound of music, and spin around with them. You know, like she does out in the field. And that like is that. such a great, great deep fake. <laughs> the hills are alive with the sound of Uzis. <laughs> so, funny story about that movie. Uh, Andrea tricked me into watching that. You know that, right? Like, I hate musicals with a passion. I cannot stand musicals. So, uh, <laughs> Andrea goes, oh, no, you have to watch it. It's like the best. And I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, it's a Saving Private Ryan was my favorite film. So, she's like, it's a World War II film. It, and Peyton, there's Nazis in it. And they, they, they're shooting and everything. And I'm like, What? Like, I don't like Nazis, but, you know, I like World War II. So she's like, no, it's a World War II period musical. You need to watch it. I'm watching this movie. The last, like, literally 120 seconds, the Nazis storm their house. They run out through the back garden. The movie ends with the the Nazi firing a gun into the darkness as they get away. And then, like, this writing, you know, the Von Trapp family would later go on, you know, like, they get away. That's the end of the movie. That was it. There was no World War II fighting at all in that movie. You were disappointed? Oh, my gosh, dude. I was like, you tricked me. So I got her back. How'd you get her back? So there was this really cool movie back in the 90s called Rapa Nui. Did you ever see that thing? I don't think so. So it's it's this rad movie about Easter Island. And it's kind of like explains the legend of Easter Island. So there's this guy. Um, it's all like, it's kind of like. It's almost like Ultimate Ninja Warrior because he has to do all these incredible feats in order to set his um, girlfriend, his lover, his wife to be free. So I told her, oh, you got to watch Rapa Nui. And she's like, no, I don't want to watch that. And I'm like, oh, no, no, you got to watch it. It's the best. I love that movie. And it's totally cheesy. But it's it's just this like Easter Island native dude just jamming around like with his knife and jumping on things and... So it was before parkour was cool. And uh, and I told her, oh, it's a romance. It's a love story. That's You got to watch it. So in the very beginning of the film, it shows their love story for all of like a minute or two, establishes that they love each other. Then these people come to the village and lock her up, put her in this cage, in this deep, dark hole for the entire movie. But he's doing it for love. So he goes and does all of his adventure action things. And then at the end, they bring her up out of the hole. And she was like, what are you talking about? This is not a romance movie. And I'm like, I gotcha. <laughs> Dude, that's for sound of music. I understand completely because in 1999, a movie came out. Now, you need to understand this is about six months before Jamie and I got married. And our entire relationship was based on the fact that we went to movies every weekend. Friday night, Saturday night, we're at the movies. 
And we'd reached the point where it used to be when we first started dating, right? Okay, you pick one this week. I got next week. You do this week. And then it reached the point where it was like, no, I can't, I can't do that movie. There's no way I can do that movie, right? Because after, you know, a while when you've been dating, you're like, all right, you know, I got limits. So I wanted to see this movie. And I might have even seen it once already. You might have heard of it called The Matrix. Oh, I have heard of that. And she goes, I'm not going to see that. And I go, it's a love story. <laughs> Cause you know how Trinity and Neo like come together at the very end. Neo, you have to be the one. Cause she told me I would fall in love with you. And I'm like, love story right there. She was so pissed after that movie. We almost broke up. I wouldn't be Are married to her today because Are of that movie. Serious? Yeah. You know, it was worth it though. It really okay, was. Your kids wouldn't have existed, you know, um, but the Matrix is a worthy cause. Hey, you know what? I got to say, if you don't like the Matrix, there's something wrong with you. You don't need that kind of negativity in your life. People. That's right. You know, hey, Matrix coming 4 up is coming four. out. I yeah. know. Hey, see? That's why we're friends. I think Except I'll to... probably like it if it's terrible and you'll you'll hate it. And then we'll talk about how we differ on films. Because I like that new Blade Runner. I didn't think it was anywhere near as good as the first one. But I, I was like, hey, more Blade Runner? Good. Yeah, but I did not appreciate Matrix two and three very much. I I like two a little bit. Three, I was like, okay, yeah, you guys lost the plot. This is nowhere near as cool as one. Yeah, no, I loved loved two and three. You did see? I, maybe I got to go Dude, back and the, watch them again. The whatever they call those machines yeah, that were cool. like from Alien, and they were you know shooting all the the Sentinels. Yeah, those, those were just cool. awesome. Yeah. The whole CGI in the tail end of that movie was just off the charts great. Yeah. I love I, it. Those were cool. I admit those were cool. I just, yeah. I you never really know a man until you fight him. <laughs> See, I've only seen two, maybe twice and three once. And I was like, I can't, I'm out. I'm done. But Matrix 1, I could not. Like, I was early in the Matrix 1. I saw it because there was nothing else good in the theater. So I went and saw it, and I was like, I hadn't heard a word. Like, I think I'd saw it opening weekend. It was a sleeper hit. I'm like, what in the heck just happened to me? Me and my buddy looked at each other like, that was amazing. <laughs> and then and then I start telling people, and I, I go to this thing like a million times, and then I go to Wales, and movies come out later there. At least they used to come out later there. So I, I go to Wales. It hits the theater after I moved there, brand new. And I tell my friends at church, you got to go see it. One of my buddies got unbelievably into it. And then I felt bad, like I corrupted him and caused idols in his life. <laughs> he was, everything was Matrix, 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 you know. And uh, I was like, yeah, I kind of broke that guy. But it was, it was, yeah, I, I, I knew a secret. He was too weak. That was his problem. <laughs> Let's see. I don't even know what these quotes are. Dude, I'm just telling you that those were like I, I saw Matrix three, I think three times the day it came out. Like I was a financial planner at the time and I went to the movies early in the morning, went on some appointments one week in the afternoon, did another appointment, went again that night. Cause I was like, I got I gotta see it again. I, I what, what happened? I gotta see it again. Love those movies. Dude, that one. That one scene, and and I remember one day because I I loved the movie. I loved, I mean, the whole movie. The first one is just art. I mean, it's just super good. There's nothing bad about the first one. Not a single thing wrong with that movie. All of it is good. And I remember at one point this scene. And keep in mind, I'm I'm, I'm not a gun guy, you know. Like I, it's and I, I I didn't own a gun, you know. I just. Literally that scene where he comes through the metal detector and drops the two bags. I remember thinking about that going, it was just randomly hit me like, how cool is that? And I literally pulled out my DVD and I'm not even kidding you. I watched that segment like 10 times where he's like running up on the walls. But yeah. that scene, for some reason, because that all was pre-9-11. Um, yeah, And so I think it hit me after 9-11, like, what, because the perspective changed. And then I went back and watched it. And I'm like, dude, just where he drops those duffel bags. And the guy's like, what in the heck? It, this is not what he said. Like I said, I watched it 10 times. I, I have it all memorized. But that was rad. Yeah. 
Yeah. Good movie. And, and then that I'd watch song, them all again. Doom, right doom, 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 by the propeller heads. So it's a good song. Yeah. Ah, uh, so good. That soundtrack was rad too. Yeah. Everything about that movie is good. By the way, Deftones, Deftones did, uh, uh, they did the, um, oh, um, my own summer, um, shove it, which is the oh, name okay. of that track. And that's in the matrix. So nice. Yeah. I think that's what he's listening to in the very beginning. It's my favorite band, everybody. So, uh, don't go out and buy Deftones music, you know, being like, oh, I want to go check them out now. You'll hate them. Um, most people I try to turn on the Deftones can't stand them. So he's starting to believe. Oh, love that movie. Yes. Yes. Lawrence Fishburne can never do anything as great as the Matrix ever again. He peaked. He did. He peaked in the Matrix. Keanu Reeves still went on to do John Wick, but I'm telling you, Lawrence Fishburne. Okay, are those good? Are the those first good? one is. The first one's great. Yeah. The second one and third and what is it? Fourth now, whatever it is. And, eh, you know, they just gun movies so i enjoy I saw, it yeah i saw where he's like riding a horse somewhere shooting people as he's riding a horse i don't remember but it wouldn't surprise yeah. me yeah but yeah anyway should we get into the topic we probably oh, wait. should wait what i got a question for you though what if i've got all of my sermons and i need to put them online but i don't want to send people to like youtube and uh you know spotify and everywhere how do i keep them all in one spot Mr. Jones. Sermon boss, 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 boss. Sermon boss beat is where, where it's this thing. <laughs> it's a good thing I brought it up because you it, would have forgotten, huh? It does this thing that like helps you with like your stuff on your thing. Um, when you're doing your thing on Sunday and you're like, I want other people to see my thing, then you know, where can I put my stuff? And then they. <laughs> <laughs> that didn't sound right. No, I saw didn't. Your face. I saw your face. Okay. No. Sermon Boss is a tool that helps you keep all of your content, your podcast, your sermons as a content producer all in one place. So you contact sermonboss.com and you have them put a plugin on your site that will help you to keep everybody on your web page. So instead of sending them off onto YouTube, you keep them right there and you can keep them consuming your content on your site. Sermonboss.com, it does what everybody else wishes their site did, and that's keep the traffic there. So if you want to have people watch a sermon about discipleship and immediately champ, uh, channel them into a discipleship tool that's also on your site, that's the way to do it. So one stop, one shop, sermonboss.com. See, I should write their commercial. I'm telling you. you I made that little slogan up just on the spot right there. Yeah, one shop, one stop, sermonboss.com. All right. You're basically a marketer. You know, I was thinking that, Pete. Like, I bet Pete's learning right now. That's what I was thinking. I was. I was taking notes. <laughs> Mentally. <laughs> all right. So uh, all that aside. Um, Great, Scott. It's time for this week's topic. Let's get down to the nitty gritty. It's a little slow there. Sorry. Hmm. Afternoon podcast. What can I After, say? It, that, that is what it is. The coffee's wearing off. Um, the exposure to kryptonite is accumulated. I'm starting to lose my Superman strength. I no longer have x-ray vision, which... I enjoy Pete when we're doing this podcast. That makes you uncomfortable, doesn't it? There's a lot of things that make me uncomfortable about you. <laughs> All right. You know, I, I do want to say the best thing ever that comes out of this podcast. These are my favorite comments. And we used to get these back in the early days where people were like, I was drinking my coffee and I spat it out in my car. <laughs> Those were the best. Knowing that we had ruined the interior of someone's car on their way to work. We were hoping you carpool. That would have been rad. But uh, anyways, hey, uh, so we're going to talk about escaping burnout. So, guys, over the last few weeks, um, I've been really honest uh, about just kind of where I've been at. Um, Pete and I will be taking a couple weeks break. I'll be on vacation. Pete will be at summer camp tormenting children. And uh, you can still check in. Well, but we'll have a little something, something for you. But that said, um, we wanted to let you know that uh, I'm doing okay. Peyton's okay. The kids are fine. Everything's fine. Everything's fine here. Like like Hans Ola says, right before he How are you doing? Intercom. How are you doing? <laughs> yeah. How are you doing? <laughs> I, I think the best 
book title ever would be I'm fine. We're all fine. Everything's fine. I think that would make a great book title for a book on burnout. But today we're going to talk because for me. And then you should put under there the subtitle, a book on burnout. (laughs) Pretty much. Because if you don't, to me, it's like church zero. What does that mean? I don't understand. I was talking all about that with Andrea this morning. I was, I was listening to an audio book about Lenny Kravitz and how he had to fight to get the right um, mix on his first album because he mixed it completely wrong. So I was talking about fighting companies and publishers and for him, it was record labels, but right. But anyways, all that to say, um, I'm doing better. You know, there, there are things, uh, this is not my first rodeo. Um, I am a high, um, I would say, you know, um, highly motivated. I do a lot of different things. I would say I'm a jack of all trades. I don't do any one thing particularly well. I kind of throw myself into way too many things all at once. Um, like podcasting, Pete, um, writing books, um, planting churches, uh, writing training, um, the list could go on and on where I probably at times just need to slow down and focus, but I'm also building my own house right now, uh, raising kids, uh, one with special needs. Like at one point sanity kicks in and you say, you know, maybe I don't do all these things all at one time. So uh, that's never been easy for me. I've always been the guy that overestimates my own abilities and underestimates the challenges and difficulties ahead. But that said, I have learned what to do, how to cut and run when I need to, how to chop certain things off, how to slow other things down. Um, Like Kenny Rogers said, you got to know when to hold them, when to fold them, know when to walk away, know when to run. And Pete's favorite part of that song is, you know, go on, Pete. I, I didn't even know there was anything after you need to know when to hold them, know when to fold you them. You never count your money when you're sitting at the table. Yeah, there's no future for me in country music. I think we can all agree. But there is a future for me without experiencing burnout, you know, on a regular basis. And there are certain ways that I do that. So um, I want to talk a little bit today. And Pete, I'd like to get your input on this because uh, – you definitely, um, I'm sure, have some things to to share about this. Okay. <laughs> so uh, how how do how do you know? Because so much of it, like you could subtitle this topic, like how to minister in the face of chaos, right? Which is always. I don't think you ever feel like you're not ministering in the face of chaos. Um, but the the first thing that I would do to avoid burnout is to pray. Um, when, when I start hitting burnout, I get an early warning system. Um, I will notice my health go down. I'll, I will start to have psychosomatic symptoms, which means your body acts out your stress. I will start to, to either get sick because stress lowers the immunity more than anything else. And I will start Raises to get, the cortisol. It does. And I start to get emotional. I get hormonal right before I get sick. So um, I have learned. So have you been sick before every one of our podcasts? <laughs> yes. Those tears are a sign of, of, of pain and weakness. I always knew you were a hormonal. I just didn't didn't know you would admit it. Yeah. So so I tend to um, I tend to get like emotional, like weepy. And when that happens, I'm like, OK, like like you need to recognize your warning like if you're starting to raise your voice with your kids, you're starting to have a short fuse. Cuss words are starting to leak out. That's the pressure cooker. The pepper pot's boiling over, as I used to say in the 1920s. So you remember that? No. Uh, but but you you basically um, you'll start to recognize the warnings. And I like Kerry Newhoff's book, which was called "Didn't See It Coming," um, because that's his book on burnout, and it's a really fantastic book. Um, But it's called Didn't See It Coming because that's the first step is recognizing the warning signs. What he says is like heading into burnout is like driving through the fog over a cliff, right? You don't realize you're getting burnout until you're falling off the cliff. And so what he does is he says, look, there are some signs like, like warnings on an odometer, you know, or on a dashboard. There are things like engine lights that go off or things. And I, I quote him in church plantology, cha-ching, you know, I had to do that. But, um, but the, but the, so, so the first thing is recognize 
you know, the warning signs. Start taking stock when you're getting burnt out of what your early warning systems are. Like I said, mine is getting weepy, um, losing energy. I start losing the ability to focus. I lose energy. I start to get sick and I start to get weepy. And when I get weepy and unreasonable, it either comes out in cranky irritability with my wife, like, and she'll just be like, okay, whatever, you know, cranky boots or whatever. And I'll be like, you know, look, yeah, you know, like I recognize it now. I don't back in the olden days, I used to make it worse by trying to justify my behavior. Now I'm like, I'm a jerk. I'm sorry. I'm obviously going through something. Yet. You know, like I'll own it and embrace it. And quickly, quickly, I don't want to alienate her when she is my greatest support and stress. Um, so that that's maybe a little tidbit there is, you know, if you're if you're tending to take it out, like quickly backtrack that. Like, here's the thing I've noticed about wives. Um, women, women like a strong man, no doubt. I'm sure um, they like us to be strong and manly and yada, yada. At least mine does. So if you're not a manly man, your wife doesn't like you. You know, I'm, I'm sorry about that. You can say I'm a toxic. Okay. Male. I have to share this story. <laughs> Do you remember <laughs> the show? Let, coach? Me, let me, fin- let me finish. No, gotta, real- okay. Okay. You remember the show coach? Yeah. And you remember how, you know, the coach was, he was like a man's man. And then his daughter dated the guy who was like this wuss. And he's, he's the, the boyfriend's talking to the dad and he's like, well, you know, I always felt like uh, uh, a woman is, is 51% female and 49% male. And a man is 51% male and 49% female. And he just goes, really? I always saw myself in the high nineties. <laughs> <laughs> That's rad. Well, so here's the thing, right? Like the way I was raised is you're tough and you're, you, you don't show, uh, you know, you're like, I'm karate man and karate man don't bruise on the outside. You bruise on the inside. Like you keep all that in. And I would say surprisingly, like to, to many of you, you would not know this. I don't think cause I podcast and talk a bunch of crap, but I'm actually more private than than probably many of you would realize. There's a reason I don't post. Like, I almost turned my video on because I'm like, ah, this is my office. I don't want you guys to see my – like, it's just weird. I have this weird thing sometimes where I'm like, that scene in Private Ryan where uh, Tom Hanks says, what's the memory of your wife? And he goes, no, that, that one's just for me, right? There's certain things. Uh, Which movie? Saving Private Ryan. I don't remember that scene. Yeah, there's a scene where he he's telling him like, oh, you have certain things you think about, you know, and and those things, you know, like he says, oh, I remember like there's two things I think about with my wife and one where she's in the garden and she's tending her flowers and I can't wait to give in. I think about that through difficult times. I was, and then and then he goes, oh, he goes, what's the other one? He goes, no, that one's just for me. And and I think there's always this sense in which we have private and public parts Um I need – that sounded wrong. I know it did, but I, know, I was dude, letting it slide. I'm not trying to do this today, and you're behaving so well. But, you know, it, it, there are certain things where I, I have – and I, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but I have certain things that I kind of keep uh, to myself that are private. Um, I don't know why I'm going off the reservation talking about that, but where I was coming to – was um, with with my wife, um, you know, I was raised like you, you don't show that weakness. Even even when I mention on the podcast, because um, I'm I think I'm fairly authentic. You know, I don't ever try to fake stuff, but I may not always. It's like it says in Proverbs. I may not always share everything. Like Proverbs says, a fool speaks all that's in his heart. So I have certain rooms that are like, well, you know, those are that's you're in the living room, but you're, you're not you're not. You're not in the bedroom. You're not. You're not in the study. You're not further back in the house. That that's stuff that's between me and God. But um, but I because I was raised that you don't share your weaknesses, yada yada. That was something that that I've learned from Jesus. That's something I've learned from being a Christian, which is a confessional religion, where you know you you, you are meant to being weak means being strong, according to Paul. So, but what I learned, and I had to learn this with my wife, was I had to learn early on, like, she needs to see my weaknesses too. Um, I will present even to her, like, I've always got it all together. 
And so I, but in the times where I started to crumble and crumple and, and like, there's times where like, like when my dad died, I became an absolute basket case in those moments, my wife just waxes strong. Like she becomes a superhuman. I, I feel like when I go through huge tragedy, I re fall in love with my wife all over again. She becomes this amazing person. And it, it a couple of times now it's made me appreciate her so much be, because she's just there for me. And I found anytime I share weakness in times where maybe I'm going a hundred miles an hour um, and where that used to cause tension, if I can acknowledge it up front early on, I've got too much on my plate or I'm doing too much or I'm burning myself out rather than being someone who is in competition with anything going on in my life, my wife immediately is there. Like, I don't know. I, everybody's relationship with their spouse is different, but with ministry, you're always giving out to other people nonstop. You're always investing in others. And where the tension can come is if you're not uh, doing that with your family. And if you're not investing in your family, if you're not discipling your family, if you're not pouring into your family, they will start to resent you and resent the ministry. Sometimes they resent God. This is why I have no desire to be a superstar. This is why, like most of my life, I want my life to be private. I want to be a private person that occasionally lets out some public things. I don't want to be a big public figure who struggles to have a private life. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I've made a choice. Like there, there are certain things I have done in my life. Like I do this podcast, but Pete and I don't try to like, that's intentional. I'm not trying to go be big and famous. Um, when I was at exponential, um, if I wanted to have a bigger platform than I have right now, I would stay, I would have stayed at exponential. My platform was growing all the time, but that's not, I have noticed our podcast numbers going down since we left Exponential. <laughs> well, you know, these things are inevitable. But, you know, the, the funny thing, Pete, the, this is this is the main thing um, that I want to start. I'm, I'm actually not gotten to my first point. I, I kind of have, but I haven't. The first thing is to pray when you're heading into burnout. Um, in the book Atomic Habits, the guy says that um, any any habit that you want to start, that takes longer than two minutes probably won't become consistent. When you're trying to start a habit, you have to start a habit for two minutes or less and just do it every day for two minutes. So that's a quick check-in with God for two minutes. No, that sounds terribly unholy to you as ministers, but let's be real. That's how the brain works. If you haven't started that habit and you're struggling to pray, two minutes every day. When you start doing that, it will grow. Once it lodges in your brain, you won't miss those two minutes and it will grow. That's how habits work. So <clears throat> what, what I would say is when you're in burnout, you check in for those two minutes, man. Even if that's all you can take, you maintain that habit. Because a lot of times what's happened is we've lost our grounding when we're heading towards burnout. We're not getting the comfort. I, I believe in the supernatural aspect of the ministry. I believe that there is the peace of God that passes understanding. I believe that there are there is a sense of worship that takes our focus off the wrong things. I believe that it alleviates stress. They show there are documented studies that show that prayer releases stress, right? Uh, like in an in order to the point where you live longer as a praying person. Stress is the number one killer. Of, of Americans, right? It, it psychosomatically leads to heart disease, yada, yada. Um, stress is a significant factor for those things. So what I would say is um, you pray. Uh, and and it, I, I go back to that time where David, it says at the Tower of Ziklag, when all of their children are taken, their wives and children are stolen uh, by the Philistines. And it says, but David, stood, they all picked up stones to stone him. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. So point one was kind of know yourself, know your early warning signs. Part two is pray, strengthen in yourself in the Lord your God. Let him strengthen you. Think of all the, the places in the scripture where David's just like you. He's saying, you are my rock. Did I go away? You did, but you're back. 
You are think, my rock. That was the last Think thing of heard. all the places where, you know, David says, you are my rock. He's not waxing theological there. He's literally saying, you are my rock because I am unstable right now, but you are stable. And so when you, when you read those through like a mirror reading, you begin to get that everything that David isn't, God is. And he's, he's coming to God as a wreck. He's a king. He's a, a general. He's a, he's a, he's got all these moving pieces. He's building an empire, a kingdom. And, and he's, he's not doing okay at times. And he's coming to God. And um, so anyways, that's one. Third thing is um, beware of substance. Um, I, I have to say this as a, as a psych nurse, um, uh, beware of substance because you're never more tempted to rely on substance as when you're approaching burnout. Um, hmm. and, and substance will hasten. It feels like it's helping. It will hasten your burnout. It will, the, the, it's a coping mechanism that actually doesn't allow you to cope. Um, it, it actually, it, it's a replacement for coping. Alcohol is not, uh, drugs, whatever it is, pot, whatever is not actually coping. It is a substitution, uh, coping mechanism, but it's not actually coping with anything. So, so what you'll find with those things is, um, you, you will, and it will, it will weaken you. It will weaken your strength, your resolve, your resilience. Um, every every drink you take during those times um, are, are it's just a downward spiral. So you you have to during the times you recognize burnout, start start evaluating your consumption of alcohol or any substance. Hopefully, you're not taking pot. I mean, I'm just going to come right out and say it. I don't care if the government says it's legal. If you're smoking pot. And you're not dying of cancer or, you know, it's not some medical thing legitimately because I, I am an advocate for what I've seen as an RN in the hospital for people suffering certain conditions that marijuana was just the go to for people dying in hospice and other things like that. But if you're just doing that because you think it's cool and fun and whatever, you're a moron. I'm just going to say it. You're, you're an idiot. Um, it's the biggest gateway drug known to man. And I'm telling you this as a guy that worked in drug rehab. Um, it, you're just buying it hook, line, and sinker. And check in with me five, ten years, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk if you're still here. Because you're not just going to be on pot anymore. Um, it's 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 going to – your life is not there, – there are two paths you can go by, as Led Zeppelin saying. And if we looked at your life – 10 years from now on pot versus without pot, there'd be a significant difference in your life, ministry, and legacy. And you can quote me on that. We'll talk about it in heaven when you see I'm right. <laughs> I don't have strong feelings about this, Pete. Um, yeah, I can't stand drugs. I can't stand pot because I just, you you know me in drugs. You know, I can't, I hate, if drugs were a person, I would kick it in the nuts and I'd punch it in the face because I I just have lost too many people due to that. But you got to watch substance. So sorry, I got a little little salty there. Um, recreation. So uh, there there's a there's a balance that needs to happen. And I know we're coming up to the end here. There's a balance that needs to happen. Um, when you're starting to hit burnout, you have to be able to to cut and run. You have to be able to you know to cut. Uh, it, you know, kind of like. Um, I love, uh, for some reason, Jonah and the whale comes to mind where as, as the, the tempest starts up, they're like, what do we need to throw overboard? Right there. now, obviously they're not thinking Jonah, but you, you kind of got two choices when you're hitting, you either throw everything else overboard or you get thrown overboard. Right. Because, um, it, it, the, the, when you have too many obligations, uh, coming up, you need to be able to look at them honestly and say something needs to give, something needs to go. So there's this dance you need to start doing, which is how do I reduce my obligations? And, and here's the other thing. How do I increase my recreations? Now, it goes against everything that we think of in, in the world of um, American Life ideals, uh, pursuit of life, liberty, and how we're, we're, we, we used to be at least a people with a strong work ethic. 
But the reality is where we're at right now is, um, you know, when I say recreation, I'm using a Hebrew understanding of recreation. Recreation means sleep. It means rest. It means time with family. It, it could mean playing, you know, playing Fortnite, playing a video game, playing, um, going out and playing a sport, uh, keeping a regular soccer night, <clears throat> you know, where you're on a team or something, going and, and blowing off steam in the gym. It doesn't matter to me, but recreation means it's the opposite of obligation. It's something you don't have to do. It's something you want to do. So suddenly what you've got to do during that crisis period is starting to um, decrease obligations and increase recreations. Because what happens when you're approaching burnout is you've done the opposite. You've increased your obligations and you've decreased your recreations. You now can't do the things you want to do. It's all your have tos. So in that sense, I would say that um, you've got to try to claw back to um, – you know, just cut. And and I don't care if you're on a leadership team. We talk about this. I can never mention this, that when you're on a leadership team, you cannot be the only leader. You need to have a leadership team in place um, so that you can immediately look at your team and say, hey, I need to cut out for a few months. Being able to just end and say, I need a sabbatical. I need a few months off. Um, I've said to... Uh, Andrew recently, I need a sabbatical. Um, and, and I have a full-time job and I've talked about, should I just have new breed and just go to my team and say, Hey, I need a sabbatical. It's been over 10 years now and I've not had one and I've done all this stupid crap over the last 10 years. And I used to have a sabbatical, you know, on a regular, but not, not like every couple of years, but like, you know, probably every seven years, roughly, um, I would, I would take a break and it might only be a, a couple months where I would just go, you know, of course I was usually moving, you know, there, there were things like that at play, but somehow you got to find the way to get a sabbatical. Um, you know, and, and a sabbatical to you might not be leaving your job. Like I don't have that luxury right now. I'm sure you don't have that luxury, but at some point you've got to get out of the game. Now, if you think, oh man, that doesn't sound biblical. Uh, if you pick up church plantology, cha-ching, I talk about the fact that Paul is burnt out on his second missionary journey, and he just goes and works with his hands uh, while Timothy and Silas continue to tear it up in Berea and Thessalonica and, you know, Lister and Derby, all the places he left. He keeps having to leave them behind. And while they raise up leaders and finish the work he could do, because he keeps getting driven out of these cities, well, when he heads over there, he um, when he finally gets to Corinth, he arrives broken. I mean, he just he just burn out. Uh, and I and I make an argument for that. So does N.T. Wright um, that I use heavily in that chapter, Chiching. Um, but he just goes and works with his hands for months because he's burnt. He's worn out. And he, so you a sabbatical for you might just mean for a few months. I'm not doing any ministry. Then when Timothy and Ty, uh, Silas get there, it says that then Paul begins to preach the gospel in Corinth. So when he first gets there, he's just working with his hands, busted up, healing. He's physically busted up from being stoned to death, beaten numerous times. He was worn out. And mentally, he was harried and frazzled because he would only start ministering in one town and the circumcision group would come, find him, beat him, stone him. And then he'd have to escape to the next town. So uh, there's a strong argument to be made that a sabbatical will um, save your brain and save prolong uh, your ministry. So these are the things that I do. And uh, they, they have helped serve me. Losing yourself in a video game, um, you know, uh, walking, exercising, eating right. I mean, that's one I didn't mention. That is a huge factor. I was so thinking that when you were talking, I was like, yeah, exercise. You need to exercise. Those release of the endorphins. And of course, most absolutely don't. And I lived most of my life not exercising. So I'm not like speaking as someone who did that for years. 
But well, and that, that is probably my saving grace right now, Pete, is I'm exercising. I'm doing Shanti for an hour a day and it's kicking the crap out of me. And I'm starting to get back in shape. Like my textbook body's disappearing, you know. I'm is that what you call become, it? Textbook yeah, body? Yeah, textbook body. Yeah, nice. it's the fattest I've been. So, but, uh, but that's it, man. So hopefully you guys, you know, but uh, by the way, um, one size does not fit all. Um, each one of you. Uh, like what Pete just said about health, that is one that like, that's never going to change. That's how God's uh, made your brain praying. That's not going to change. Knowing yourself, that's not going to change. Beware of substance. That's not going to change. Uh, recreation and obligations. That's not going to, these are all things that are just, that's just the way it works. But what is one man's castaway is another man's treasure. So we, we did, there can't be a prescription for you, what this looks like for you will be completely different. Like if I got rid of all my obligations, I think I would head into a deeper depression and burnout. I need something at all times to kind of keep me going. I can't just sit around and do nothing. That that would that would depress me and burn me out faster mm. than anything. Is cause how I'm wired, you know? Right. So but that's it. Well hey Pete, with all these things, all this fight and burnout and you You're know, beaten. praying and yeah. Uh, how do you make sure that you see, you know, because the last thing you want to do during that time, Pete, is do your finances and, you know, tax compliancy. What do you do? You know, I'm so grateful that you've asked me, Peyton, because I get to share a company that's close to my heart, a company that means a lot to me. SimplifyChurch.com. SimplifyChurch.com. They take care of all of those things that no one really wants to do. In fact, some might say they're for the non-math pastor. You know, Pete, I, it makes sense to me now why you named your third child Simplify Church Mitchell. Uh, what are they working on today? Yeah, it's the electricians. They're cutting into drywall, which I wish they weren't, but they are. In other words, yeah. there was a mistake made. Mistakes were made. <laughs> and stress. Great. Love it. Yes, but uh, at this point, I'm like... You know, uh, cut and dry while getting hard. We all right, that's fine. So, <clears throat> but uh, well, guys, thanks for joining us. Oh, head to simplifychurch.com. There we go. I should have shut up nicely with a little bow. Uh, guys, thanks for joining us today. This has been Peyton Jones and Pete Mitchell, who never gets to talk, uh, reminding you that if you want to reach ones nobody's reaching, you need to go where nobody's going and do what nobody's doing. Take care, everybody. Thanks for joining us for another weekly episode of the Church Planner Podcast with Pete Mitchell and Peyton Jones. We'd love to hear your comments on this episode of the Church Planner Podcast. Visit us online and let us know what you thought at churchplannerpodcast.com. If you subscribe to us via iTunes and have enjoyed the podcast, leave us a positive review. The more positive reviews we receive in iTunes, the more iTunes will promote us to other church planners who would benefit from this show. This podcast is brought to you by the Church Planner Magazine, which is available in the iTunes newsstand or online via churchplannermagazine.com. Music